Hello and welcome to this first class of the course Basics of Semiconductor Devices and Technology. In this module, I am going to walk you through a brief history of semiconductors, devices and technology. The idea of this module is to give you a perspective of how things evolved uh, over the period of time, how um, curiosity led to new discovery, new discovery led, led to science explorations, those scientific explorations led to uh, technological evolution or translation of science into technology and how the translation of science into technology or the new technologies led to the commercialization which eventually led to the kind of uh, uh, technological and the scientific ecosystem that we see around uh, which is uh, which has very strong foundations or which strongly depends uh, on the foundation of uh, semiconductors and related technologies. So what we often know or what we often hear about is you know the history of semiconductors goes back to uh, invention of p-n junction diodes or invention of uh, uh, silicon based or germanium based uh, diodes or bipolar junction transistor. Often in textbook we also read about uh, the great inventions related to silicon based or germanium based p-n junction diodes or, or bipolar transistors and, uh, <clears throat> um, and the fact that those uh, inventions were driven by um, the, the issues related to vacuum devices or vacuum diodes or vacuum triodes and the whole effort was to miniaturize uh, those vacuum triodes or vacuum diodes and that led to invention of those solid state devices uh, based on silicon or germanium in the form of p-n junction and later on in in, in form of uh, bipolar junction transistor and we also know that subsequently the understanding which developed as part of those inventions for p-n junction um, helped um, inventing devices like mosfets and then those MOSFETs were further integrated and that was basically the um, the time when uh, silicon MOSFETs or, or bipolar junction transistors were integrated together and you know uh, circuits were demonstrated and those many many transistors integrated together led to demonstration of large scale circuits and then there was a time uh, close to 20 years back when uh, the world had seen um, integrated circuits with more than a billion transistors integrated on the same chip. However, uh, many of us um, often miss the fact that the real um, discovery uh, or the history of semiconductors dates back to Faraday's time. Um, when Faraday, for instance, observed a compound which had shown very poor um, conductivity at room temperature but the conductivity significantly increased when the temperature was increased. Now this was you can imagine that uh, 180 years back this was a very unusual phenomena because we know and people at that time knew uh, that dielectrics or insulators don't change their uh, property as a function of temperature, particularly in terms of the resistive or resistive nature of the semiconductor of the of the dielectric or the insulator doesn't change. Um, consider dielectric as the insulator here. Dielectric can be a, I mean, any material can be dielectric. So we're talking about insulator. That the resistance of the insulator or the insulating properties of an insulator would not change uh, drastically uh, up to a reasonable temperature. On the other hand, as far as the, the metal is concerned, we all know that if you if you extract resistance as a function of temperature, the resistance will only increase as a function of temperature. Now, here um, Faraday found a different compound, a compound which apparently show a reverse behavior where the resistance falls when you increase the temperature. Now this was completely unusual and not it uh, and not something which can be explained by the uh, the laws which were known at that time for insulators or metals or any material which was often categorized as either insulator or or metal. Uh, 
the concept of semiconductor was yet not known it was yet not known that there can be a material which could be semiconducting in nature uh, which could be for instance uh, uh, insulating at room temperature or lower temperature and could be conducting at higher temperature or when they are doped so uh, this led to uh, to uh, similar kind of studies where people observed uh, the same kind of uh, resistance uh, versus temperature behavior where the resistance falls as a function of temperature in many different materials and for instance you know um, uh, around 1851 Johann and Hitoff uh, observed that uh, sulfides of copper and silver have a similar kind of behavior today we know that these sulfides are semiconducting materials but you can imagine that at that time these were merely metal compounds uh, or heavy metal compounds and they had shown these kind of uh, uh, temperature behavior now this was the uh, the the behavior the conductivity of a compound or a material as a function of temperature now what about light that was also unusual that you know a material changing its property as a function of the light which shines on it you can imagine that 150 years back when the the typical known materials were either metal or insulator and you know that metal or insulator don't change its its uh, resistive property or its conductive property as a function of uh, you know whether light shines on it or light falls on it or not and now here you have material for instance uh, in this case selenium or in in other explorations silver sulfide we already talked about sulfides of these heavy metals so you have these sulfides or selenium uh, which uh, show that when you shine light um, their conductivity changes today we know that semiconductors have this kind of property and what usually happens is if the 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 energy of the light or the uh, the wavelength associated with the, uh, with the light is higher than the the band gap difference of uh, of the material or the semiconductor in particular if it is a direct band gap semiconductor the uh, the material will uh, produce electron hole pairs and that will lead to um, uh, excess conductivity of the material but you can imagine that 150 years back this was not known because the concept of semiconductor was known not known so what i'm trying to highlight is that there were several many many observations during the older time which basically gradually led people to come to a point that something could be semiconducting in nature in fact i'll show you later that the uh, the discovery of point diode point contact diode or uh, uh, what we today know uh, know as uh, as uh, schottky diode uh, had happened much before the pn junction theory came or had happened much before you know any diode theory came into existence So similarly, the photovoltaic effects that we know today that uh, any junction, if uh, uh, light falls on that, there will be excess carriage generation and that can lead to, in a specific condition, depending on how the junction is designed, can lead to open circuit voltage across the junction. And if you connect a load um, to that junction, uh, the load will start driving current out of it. So we know that this is called the solar cell, but you can imagine during those years when uh, the chemical cells were known and now here there is a chemical cell which <coughs> starts uh, uh, producing uh, potential difference when one of the electrode shines or one of the electrode, electrode experiences, experiences light. Um, now today we can guess that what could have been, what could have happened that you know either the light may result into um, electrons being emitted out of the electrode that could be the photoelectric effect or if the electrode was made of uh, of a semiconducting material um, the electrode may uh, depending on the nature of the electrode the electrode may result into excess carriage generation which can lead to some some chemical change around it or which can lead to uh, the current flow across between the two electrodes but you can imagine that during those years this was uh, this was you know this kind of behavior was not possible to be explained using classical physics which was known during those years um, 
to put things in perspective, you would know that even the Maxwell's theories were not in place. Uh, the theory explaining the electromagnetic waves were also not in place during that time. The, the behavior of light was not known at that time. Um, whether light is wave or particle was not known at that time. Um, and uh, there were basic observations related to electricity, for instance, the Faraday's law and so on, where had started coming to existence uh, in, the, in the times we are talking about. So um, this uh, leads, takes us as talking about these PN junction uh, kind of diodes or basically point contact diodes. But the, the invention of point contact diode or the observation that uh, a particular system can behave like a point contact diode uh, came from these experiments where people noticed rectification, rectification behavior uh, from these metal sulfides. Again, I told you that these metal sulfides were, were known. Um, so we are talking about 1874 and metal sulfides came into existence around 1851. So you can imagine that a lot of work happened on metal sulfides and their properties were fascinating to many of these uh, chemists and physicists of that time. And in one of the experiment, for instance, Brown noticed that if you have metal sulfide and you connect this metal sulfide uh, crystal uh, with, with uh, metallic electrodes, the system will offer you a rectification behavior. So you can imagine that this is the time when the, uh, the AC waves were discovered, the, electrom uh, the electromagnetic Theory was in place. The uh, the uh, the uh, alternating current um, was in place, and people experimented that when alternating current flows through this kind of system, the uh, the system has rectifying behavior, which means only one of the cycle uh, uh, allows the current to flow, whereas the other cycle doesn't experience any current resultant to that particular uh, voltage applied across the system. Right uh, now, today we can we can say that yes, this is uh, this is nothing but a metal semiconductor junction or a metal uh, semiconductor based short key diode, and uh, a short key diode like any PN junction diode will offer a rectification or rectifying behavior. But at that time, this was something unusual and uh, something worth exploring further. So again, this was metal sulfide in one of the experiment. In other experiment, it was copper oxide with copper. So this also copper oxide today we know that is a semiconductor uh, and copper with copper oxide will form uh, a semiconductor metal heterostructure or heterojunction which is nothing but a short key uh, junction or short key uh, diode. Um, Jagdish Chandra Bose we all know um, also conducted several experiments based on these observations and in fact uh, he was um, one of the pioneer in in detecting radio waves uh, based on these crystal detectors and these crystal detectors were nothing but uh, similar kind of semiconducting crystals connected with metal electrodes uh, resulted into these kind of uh, short key heterojunctions and these short key heterojunctions today we know well, very well that will result into uh, you know uh, devices which can be used uh, for detection of radio waves. So um, this is the um, this is the apparatus which basically Bose developed for uh, for demonstrating uh, operation of these radio wave detectors. Uh, you have the transmit the uh, the receiving part and the transmitting part, and um, what the demonstration of detection of the radio wave were done. Uh, these are those uh, um, those point contact detectors. Uh, which allowed the detection of radio wave. In fact, Bose filed a patent in 1901 and this patent is considered the first patent for a semiconductor device. So now you can imagine that with almost 75 years of explorations, uh, curiosity driven explorations, studies uh, led to uh, practical devices, 
and these practical devices you know uh, eventually and these explorations eventually led to uh, what we know today as semiconductor but in fact it was only 1901 when the first uh, device was patented which was based on a semiconducting material now the other aspect of these semiconductors as we know is electroluminescence what is the electroluminescence that when you apply a certain field uh, photons may emit out of certain kind of certain type of semiconducting materials and this is also something which was interesting at that time that you know people for instance henry round uh, in in 1907 uh, found that a particular set of materials when you apply bias um, would emit light of different wavelength and this wavelength of the light will depend on the amount or the extent of field that you apply across the material. Now this was something very interesting and worth exploring subsequently and these are the these are the you know initial curiosity driven explorations which led to all kind of light emitting diodes and and uh, uh, the diodes which are uh, the devices which are fundamentally based on the electroluminescence principle that we see today. Now, you know, I talked about almost 80 years of period when, you know, a lot of curiosity driven explorations happened, uh, many observations be, were being made and some of them were translated uh, from science into technology. Now, subsequently comes the commercialization era. So this was only 90 years back when these explorations were, uh, were uh, converted into uh, what we see today as commercial technologies, right? So for instance, uh, AT&T Bell Labs uh, filed a patent uh, on a crystal detector and that was based on, on silicon. Um, so that was basically, I would say, among the first devices which were based on silicon, and that was also the time when silicon uh, was in existence, and existence and silicon was explored for these kind of applications. Around 1922, um, you see copper, copper oxide-based rectifiers being invented. I mean, the behavior was noticed almost 30 years before this particular uh, patent, but the patent happened. Uh, in 1922, when uh, these kind of devices were commercialized. The negative resistance behavior also seen in these kind of uh, diodes or these kind of semiconducting metal junctions. Uh, and that was the time when, for instance, around 1924 was the time when negative resistance based diodes were commercialized for many of these microwave applications. And it was 1930 uh, when the PN junction uh, using silicon was discovered and uh, based on that um, you know radar detectors or several detectors were developed. So you can imagine that you know, in the initial days the detection of radio wave was of a primary interest. Um, the microwave was of primary interest rather than the kind of other consumer electronic application that we see today. The consumer electronic applications came uh, a li little later. Um, the interest at that time was mostly microwave communication and that was again driven by the push uh, you know for for developing electronics or developing gadgets for uh, for you know all kind of wars which was happening around that time so let's go back slightly so I basically talked about the evolution of semiconductor um, for almost 100 years from uh, the very first uh, observation being made by Faraday uh, to um, the devices being um, invented by or the behavior being invented by, by Shockley and that's why the previous uh, um, part was titled as the evolution from Faraday to the Shockley. Right. But now let's go back. I mean all of this whatever I talked about was based on observations uh, being made um, and those observations uh, uh, led to studies, scientific studies, and those scientific studies led to uh, certain commercial products or certain commercial technologies. Uh, but parallel to this, a lot of development happened in understanding those phenomena, um, and uh, uh, and the the development was not driven by, I would say, the observations which were primarily based on some of these semiconducting materials, 
but the observations were uh, driven by some of the fundamental aspects or the explorations or the the uh, the explorations of modern physics or what we know today as quantum mechanics were based on some of the aspects which could not be explained using classical physics or or the, the the principles of classical physics or the Newtonian mechanics which was known till that date. Um, I'll talk about some of these things in, in greater detail in the next module when I talk about the origin of quantum mechanics. But let me just give you a quick um, walkthrough uh, across uh, or to, to guide you quickly through the evolution of quantum mechanics. So um, it actually dates back a pretty uh, uh, slightly before uh, Planck uh, being demonstrated black body radiation. The black body radiation was observed, but uh, even before Planck, um, uh, but it could not be explained using the classical uh, methods or the classical uh, ways of, of uh, explaining physics or the statistical physics uh, based methods. Um, and it was Planck which basically tried to explain uh, the black body radiation by introducing the term quanta. And uh, when he introduced the term quanta and said that the, the, the light uh, should be emitted or absorbed in the quanta and is a discrete entity, not a continuous entity, he was able to explain uh, the black body radiation and fit to the, uh, to the spectra uh, precisely. And that led to basically um, what is today called the explanation for or the quantum mechanical explanation for explanation for the black body radiation. So in many sense, this was the first um, discovery uh, which led the foundation of modern physics or quantum mechanics. Then comes uh, in 1905, Albert Einstein explained the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect was observed. Uh, since many uh, years, or I would say more than more than a decade, uh, but it was Einstein in 1905 who explained uh, um, the behavior or who explained the photoelectric effect um, <clears throat> again using the the concept of quanta, which was apparently introduced by uh, by Max Planck few years back. Um, then in 1911, uh, Rutherford uh, proposed an atomic model which of course was further challenged by other people and then came to the Bohr model, we'll talk about that. Um, and that, that's basically 1913 when Niels Bohr proposed a different uh, you know, uh, model or the, which is today called Bohr's theory of atom and he explained how a hydrogen atom um, um, would look like and he basically proposed the concept of discrete states of energies and that's basically the is still considered as the most advanced model available for the hydrogen atom. Um, in 1923, Crompton, we all know uh, Crompton. Crompton basically um, um, scattered the X-ray or X-rays by electrons. So you can think in this way that X-rays, which are photons, um, in some sense are, are believed to be waves and you have electrons which are believed to be particles. So now a wave being scattered by particle um, shows that the photons behave like particle or the electrons behave like waves. So basically this, uh, this um, experiment was uh, validated that uh, the, the waves behave like particle and you know uh, that's how the, the uh, that's the only way the particle can scatter with another particle. Um, 1923, uh, De Broglie uh, put the matter wave hy hypothesis um, and his hypothesis was that the particles also behave like wave um, or the waves will behave like particle. So many of these things happened at the same time. So you can imagine that people were working on these ideas parallelly. And then when you put all those dots together, then you can build um, or you can basically correlate each of them uh, systematically. In 1925, uh, Heisenberg gave the uncertainty principle and he also came up with what is known as matrix mechanics, um, which is one way of, of explaining uh, quantum mechanics or one way of solving uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, Schrodinger came up with the wave mechanics in our in this course 
we will focus more on the wave mechanics approach of, of uh, explaining quantum mechanics or the quantum behavior of objects. Um, and uh, further, in 1925, as I said above, Heisenberg's matrix mechanics came into existence. In 27, uh, Davison and Thomson did this famous experiment, which was Davison German experiment. And what they demonstrated was they demonstrated interference pattern uh, using electrons. Now, you all know that the interference pattern is usually formed when you have two waves and they basically um, uh, add together or subtract together and forming an interference pattern. But an electron, two uh, independent electron beams forming interference pattern shows that electrons or these energetic electrons also exhibit uh, wave-like properties while they are particles. Um, in 1927, Max Born put the probability, uh, probability interpre interpretation for the wave mechanics. So he tries to basically um, uh, solve the Schrodinger wave equation uh, using what is known as the probability density function. And that's something we will discuss more in detail later on. Um, now, in 1928, Paul Dirac uh, put the complete theoretical formulation for quantum mechanics and developed what is called as operator algebra in quantum mechanics. If you are solving uh, more complex systems, the operator algebra helps solving uh, or explaining the quantum behavior of that system in a much better way than the matrix uh, mechanics or the wave mechanics can do. In 1932, um, the positron were discovered. The positron, you can think of positron as a particle similar to electron with a positive charge. And of course, around the same time, the annihilation of electron, positron, and as a result of that, uh, emission of photon was all discovered around the same time. And then uh, von Neumann in 1932 uh, basically came up with this very solid mathematical framework for quantum mechanics using the operator algebra, which was again based on what Paul Dirac did in the recent time. So this was uh, this was the entire uh, life cycle of you know what all happened and what led to the foundations of quantum mechanics and the quantum mechanics that we use today. So uh, almost 45 to 50 years of work, which basically set the foundations of quantum mechanics. And subsequently, after 1930, many of the discoveries, many of the discoveries in modern physics, particle physics, uh, including cosmology. Uh, string theory, they all um, uses quantum mechanics to be explained, various observations and phenomena being made, including semiconductors. Now let's talk about the technology part of uh, the electronics. The technology part of the electronics started with, uh, with you know, in the early days with vacuum tube electronics. Um, the invention, the vacuum tubes were invented around the same time when the first uh, patent on semiconductor was filed, 1901. Uh, John A. Fleming was the uh, was the scientist who basically invented a vacuum tube diode, um, and then uh, Lee Forrest in 1907 um, invented a vacuum uh, wall based triode. Um, few years later, uh, in 1916, round. Uh, developed the low anode capacitance valve. So now you can see that you have diode, you have triode, you have a capacitor, uh, the resistor is already in place. So now you have all basic building blocks to build uh, systems and circuits uh, using these, these valves. But looking into the picture, you would have realized that these valves or these triodes or diodes are very bulky in nature. And therefore, even a basic simple calculator was, was bigger than uh, the size of, uh, of you know, uh, an entire house during those years. So um, then the other aspects of, of uh, semiconductor is basically the development of the theoretical understanding for semiconductors. Uh, 
uh, as we know that the semiconductors, the, the very first one, you know, uh, being observed by Faraday and there are many, many decades of work, but uh, you have to notice that when people actually started observing uh, or people actually started putting theoretical work or, or experimental uh, work explaining the behavior of these materials, which eventually led to the term called semiconductors uh, over the period of time. So um, the very first one in this direction was Hall effect. The Hall effect, uh, we all know, I mean, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about Hall effects uh, in subsequent modules, but it was 1879 when Edwin Hall proposed what today we know as Hall effect. In 1886, uh, the germanium came, came into existence uh, much before silicon. Um, 1897 was the time when, uh, when the electron was discovered. Uh, 1907 when the Hall effect in the semiconductors was shown. Um, and uh, it was 1916 when it was confirmed that the, the primary source of current in metals are electrons. Um, then today we all know about impurities in semiconductors and how we dope semiconductors to play with the, uh, the conductivity type being either n-type or p-type but the hypothesis uh, uh, you know uh, which basically led to all these uh, doping discoveries later on was uh, came into existence in 1924 uh, with the impurity hypothesis on the electrical conduction of semiconductors and how the conductivity can be modulated by, by introducing impurities in semiconductor. Um, then in 1921, uh, Bloch, Felix Bloch um, put the quantum theory of solids using Bloch waves to describe electrons. Uh, now this is something that we will see uh, in subsequent modules and in 1931, the band theory for semiconductor uh, came into existence and only when the band theory came into existence, the explanation for the negative temperature coefficient of resistance came into existence. So now you can see that this was very much almost 100 years after Faraday's observation of a material behaving or offering this negative temperature coefficient of resistance. Then in 1938, the role of minority carriers in semiconductor came into existence. Today we all know the role of minority carrier. You dope a material, you would have majority carriers because of the dopants, you will have minority carriers uh, uh, in the semiconductor. Uh, but the theoretical foundation to explain the minority carriers in semiconductor happened in 1938. Um, then similar behavior was explained in, in for instance, in germanium. Uh, so role of dopants, the dopant came into existence, for instance, uh, the, the experimental existence of dopant came into picture in early 1940s, and that was by Karl Horowitz, um, where he explained uh, or de and demonstrated the role of dopants in germanium and how the germanium conductivity can be changed by introducing these external dopants. Um, and subsequent to this, this explanation or this experimentation, uh, the theory of dopants was established uh, by Bardeen in Bell Labs in 1949. And now since you have the foundation for semiconductor B in place, the, uh, the band structure, the band theory is in place, the concept of dopant is in place, the concept of minority carriers is in place and using all of this Shockley could explain a theory of PN junction in semiconductor and use of PN junction based junction transistors in 1949 by William Shockley. So um, this is that famous picture of uh, uh, Shockley, John Bardeen and uh, Walter Britton from Bell Lab which received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1956, uh, where they invented and demonstrated uh, point contact germanium-based transistor. Uh, 
And uh, you have you can imagine that most of these inventions uh, were in the founding the foundation uh, required for this kind of invention was you know happened for a period of almost uh, 60 years uh, all the way starting from the the Hall effect um, to um, uh, to theory for for impurities in dopants to experimental demonstration of dopants in semiconductor to invention of silicon to invention of germanium to in experimental demonstration of doping and dopants in in germanium uh, and then subsequently uh, invention of pn junction and then subsequently from pn junction to this point contact uh, three terminal transistor um, if you talk about the junction transistors we know that 1949 william shockley um, um, came up with this junction transistor concept he based on the point contact transistor he conceived an improved transistor structure which was again based on this fundamental understanding of of uh, various things which have been explored in the past like doping and pn junction and and minority carrier majority carrier band structure and so on and so forth and based on all these understandings he basically conceived an improved transistor structure um, um, based on the theoretical understanding which was already developed for for the pn junction um, and it was then 1951 when basically um, again in bell labs in gordon teal and uh, morgan spox basically used this concept and demonstrated um, you know a npn junction transistor using germanium based on the theories which were uh, or the, the the improvised structure which was conceived by william shockley in bell labs of course uh, then subsequently a lot of work happened in terms of improving these semiconductors and that was that was the time when uh, well when companies like bell labs started working on methods to improve these materials um, uh, improve the yield of the process, miniaturize these, the size of these transistors, integrate many, many transistors together and so on. So for instance, these materials were not so in, were not available in so pure condition and uh, that led to this, this method which you uh, will study in other courses called zone refining technique uh, for uh, basically making these semiconductors ultra pure material and if they are ultra pure you can imagine that they are they are free from unwanted impurities and if they are free from unwanted impurities they are free from unwanted dopants being present in these materials which can lead to or which can deteriorate the, the properties of pn junction or the property of the properties of these these uh, junction transistors um, as far as the transistor um, consumer product is concerned uh, Transistor came into existence in many, many um, new products, portable products, as the transistor was miniaturized. In the very beginning, it came into existence in, uh, in hearing aid, uh, when first transistor consumer product in the US uh, was made, which was based on germanium uh, uh, material, and the company name, in fact, was Germanium Product Corporation, um, where they used this, this device in hearing aid kind of, uh, kind of systems. Um, then first transistor based radio came into existence um, in Germany. Um, first transistor based radio came into existence in US around the same time. Um, um, and that was basically a joint venture between Texas Instruments and uh, Regacy uh, Division of Industrial Development Engineering Associates. This was another company and then you have Texas Instruments over there and they jointly came up with this first transistor based radio in the US. And uh, then you had, you know, these germanium uh, transistor-based clocks, hearing aids, trans transistor radios, and several companies adopted to it. For instance, Tokyo Telecom, um, which was later named as Sony, and Sony is a company that you all know today. So, um, then uh, around 1953, um, the, you know, the first transistor based 48 bit computer was was demonstrated um, and uh, at later stage at bell labs um, 
a fully um, transistor based computer was was developed for us air force now one should keep in mind that now this transistor based computers are all uh, based on the triac device or the vacuum tube devices um, subsequently at the mit lincoln lab uh, a 5 megahertz general purpose digital computer was was demonstrated um, and around the same time japan was also able to develop first transistor based computer uh, again for uh, military applications then um, how the silicon transistors evolved i mean so far i talked about uh, if it is computer it was all vacuum tube based if it was transistor it was all germanium based uh, it was uh, in 1954 morris ten bomb at bell labs fabricated the first silicon transistor uh, i told you that the silicon was already invented by this time and uh, and the the, uh, the fundamental uh, principle of semiconductors or the foundation of semiconductor the band structure theory the p n junction theory was already in place um germanium problems related to germanium and stability and and uh, uh, instability at high temperature was already uh, people already started realizing that so dealing with germanium was difficult uh, was was already known at this time and that that was the reason why people started thinking of other alternatives alternatives other than germanium I mean, germanium happened because it came into existence before silicon so a lot of inventions happened in germanium but when silicon was present which offers properties better than germanium in terms of stability and and growth and large area fabrication then it was very obvious that people will look for alternatives and people will look for for the same thing being implemented using silicon and all of this led to the uh, the the discovery of or i would say um, the demonstration of uh, first silicon based transistor um by marston bomb in in bell labs in fact you would have noticed by now that most of these inventions happened in bell labs in us at that time um so uh, and then uh, um uh, in the same time for instance this picture this is sketch is uh, that first is sketch which uh, ti did um uh, at that time you know the ti uh, developed the silicon based transistor and this is sketch is from their their work at that time and this was the team uh, from ti uh, silicon transistor team which uh, which includes morris ten bomb and charles lee at, at bell labs so um, what involved in developing this process i mean you have to dope uh, these uh, these materials to introduce uh, uh, n type op type doping and uh, that was basically uh, that that became possible through the diffusion process that was developed for these transistors and it was a diffusion process that allowed the dopants to diffuse to the material and make them p type or n type specifically um then we all know that uh, that for processing we may need some kind of masking and that was basically developed uh, again at bell labs uh, around this time um which uh, which used the oxide based masking for selectively diffusing dopants either in, in in some region or the other region um um and now to open this mask you need a technique a printing technique which today we know as photolithography and that was also developed around the same time so basically use photolithography to print a certain pattern to open uh, windows in silicon or open windows through this oxide mask and basically then let the diffusion take place through these openings and makes make the regions n type or p type selectively um now so now by 1955 58 the concept of semiconductor p n junction uh was pretty well known the the foundation of quantum mechanics was already in place the quantum tunneling was pretty well known and that was the time when for instance leo isaki at sony i talked about sony earlier that sony was already in the game and developing these uh, these transistors and these systems based on on semiconductors so leo isaki from sony um 
reported a new type of diode which exhibited negative resistance or negative differential resistance which exploits the quantum mechanical tunneling effect. Now what is this negative differential resistance? You see in his notes if you plot the current if I, if I show here if I plot the current and voltage you all know that if you have a diode or a, a conductor the current will increase but now there is a region where the current actually falls as a function of voltage before it again starts rising so this region is the negative differential resistance region and this region uh, was found to basically uh, quite useful in, in producing radio waves or detecting radio waves or, or, or microwaves. So this particular device was used subsequently in many of the um, RF applications and, uh, and what it shows is that the first negative resistance diode um, or also known as the Saki diode um, came into existence in 1958. Um, the commercial production of The commercial production of silicon mesotransistors transistors or uh, the silicon based transistors started uh, with Fairside Semiconductor uh, where they basically developed this uh, double diffused uh, silicon mesotransistor transistor uh, process uh, which, uh, which again uses the same principle which was developed at TI and Bell Lab and for instance what you see here is their diffusion area. Uh, where um, the dopants were diffused in these, these, uh, these selective regions to make collector base and emitter contacts. A lot of uh, focus uh, shifted from, uh, from Bell Labs to Texas Instruments where Texas Instruments uh, started building microcircuits using these uh, germanium based PNP transistors. Um, and in fact, this invention of integrating multiple transistors together uh, to demonstrate circuit behavior on chip um, received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2000. Um, so what you see, for instance, here, this is the, the very first germanium based solid state oscillator. And this was based on several transistors being integrated, as you see in this picture, uh, on the same chip. Um, the, um, at Fairchild, for instance, uh, no, uh, Robert Noyes demonstrated method of uh, diffusing uh, dopants in multiple regions on the same process and then integrating them together with, with uh, metal connections. And this was also uh, uh, you know, a way by which uh, uh, several uh, components were mono monolithically integrated in a circuit configuration on the same chip. And what they demonstrated, for instance, uh, they demonstrated interconnection of diodes, transistors, resistors, capacitors, all diffused into silicon and connected with aluminium metal lines. So this was this patent uh, led to the foundation of these uh, these um, VLSI or large scale integration concept that we see today. And then, of course, everything shifted later on from bipolar junction transistors to to MOSFETs. Um, again, the shift from bipolar junction transistor to MOSFET happened happened because of this discovery or this invention of MOSFET and uh, setting the foundations for, for MOSFET projects again at Bell Lab in 1959. Uh, and the, um, one of the idea with MOSFET was that you, know, you can scale things so nicely compared to what you can do with the bipolar transistor and integration with these MOSFETs was a lot easier than what you can do with these bipolar transistors. So, um, so this picture actually shows among the first MOS transistor based integrated circuit 
uh, which was uh, demonstrated in 1962. So this is all from uh, as far as the history is concerned. I would uh, guide you to a few more references if you are uh, interested further. Um, I hope this will give you a broad picture of how things evolved and what were the key inventions, discoveries in the past, um, particularly from 1830 to 1965, uh, that, that period of 125, 130 years, and how uh, the field evolved from the, the very basic observation of a material which today we know as a semiconductor or very basic observation of of properties which are which today we know are properties related to to semiconductor to many many observations and subsequent experiments being set around that and uh, many many theoretical foundations and improvised uh, concepts and device theories uh, being set uh, based on that and of course many of those things were further supported by the discovery uh, and the foundation of quantum mechanics which which happened in the same time and then uh, subsequent push for commercialization subsequent push for integration subsequent push for large scale integration subsequent push for for um, developing these uh, these uh, these systems uh, for uh, for consumer applications or I would say beyond uh, military applications and so these are the collective things which led to the kind of uh, technology that we see today uh, and most of these technologies uh, are based on the foundations of, of semiconductors, devices and related technology. With this, thank you very much and I will see you in the next class.